What would happen if you could stop worrying so much about what your team was doing all day and instead focus in on what you're supposed to be doing to move your business forward? Sounds like a dream, but right now you're living the nightmare of having to overcoach, overhandhold, and overcheck in on your team's work. Let's put an end to that and instead roll out super clear five hour work plans drum beats, and more of my signature tools that drive accountability and self-sufficiency deep into your team. All you have to do is join a Leadership Lab program, and I'll help you turn your team troubles into triumphs. You'll be learning and growing alongside some peers that will become valuable business friends. So why not go beyond this podcast and join us? It could be the smartest thing you do this year. Book a call with me and see what program would best fit you over at the website, stackingyourteam.com slash programs. I have five pages of notes here that I took. Uh, That's how I process information. I'm an avid note taker anyways, but I find it so fascinating that every time we talk about a type a vision of one or two I know. people <laughs> come to mind. They really do come to mind. It is. And it, uh, yeah. It, yeah, you get me in my sweet spot and I'm lost in this because it's just so deep and there's so much, you know, the Enneagram and communication, the Enneagram and decision making, relationships. I mean, it just, yeah, it just can apply to so many areas of our life. Welcome to Stacking Your Team, a show for entrepreneurs who are ready to step into the CEO role of their business by attracting and retaining key talent. Hey there, I'm Natalie Ekdahl, host of the Biz Chicks podcast. Our clients and community are rapidly expanding their businesses and need support as they stack their teams. Your incredible host, Shelly Warren, leverages her background growing and leading teams in multiple organizations, including a Fortune 50 corporation. So are you ready to stack your team? Here's Shelly. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm so happy you found us. It's the place to be if you're building an incredible team for your business. And if you've been a long time listener, thanks so much for joining me each week. I love to connect with you. Tell me what has been helpful for you and what would you like me to share in upcoming episodes? Drop me an email at Shelly at bizchicks.com. That's Shelly with an I at B-I-Z-C-H-I-X dot com. I would love to hear about you, your business and your team. So here's what we've got planned for you on today's show. Have you noticed that personality tests are suddenly hot again? I kind of think they always were. And today we're going to talk about one of my absolute favorites. The Enneagram. And I guarantee that you'll find yourself matching people you know to each type. I know, I did it too. We just can't help ourselves. It's too easy and too much fun. If you've never taken the Enneagram test, no worries. This episode is chock full of insight on each type and you will recognize yourself. Teresa McCloy joins us today. She points out the superpower of each type and the all-important blind spots. Yes, we need to know our blind spots, recognize them when they pop up, and stack our team with diversity so that we are incredibly effective together. And spoiler alert, there is no one best personality type to lead people. Every type has its superpowers, and oh yeah, While you're having fun recognizing your friends, family, and team members and matching them to a type, just remember, you're being matched too. Teresa also asks a key question in the Ask Me Anything wrap-up about how I overcome 
one of my own blind spots that can get into my way. Because you see, well, Teresa and I, we're the same type on the Enneagram. And also stay tuned to the end of the episode, where I will share some famous people from past and present and their type. Okay, so are you ready to stack your team using the superpowers of the Enneagram? Then come on, let's do it. We have a BizChicks client and community member who has built her entire business using the Enneagram as the foundation to help her clients solve big problems. Teresa McCloy, owner of Real Life, is a certified Enneagram coach, speaker, and productivity expert. Welcome to the podcast, Teresa. Thank you so much, Shelly. I'm so excited to be here. This is like a dream for me. Aw, this is a dream for me because I love the Enneagram. I was introduced to the Enneagram in my corporate career years ago. And at the same time, we were learning about Myers-Briggs and DISCs. And then more recently, the Colby. I was introduced to the Colby Assessment. My heart has always leaned over into the Enneagram. I don't even know why, other than I just love that there's nine types. And for whatever reason, it just really resonated with me. So when you and I met, of course, you're one of our amazing Biz Chicks clients, and I soon realized that you were an Enneagram expert. I knew I wanted to have you on the podcast. And so now we finally have a chance to connect and be able to come and join together today. And I'm so excited for you to be able to walk us through these nine types and talk to us about how do we become a better leader within our type? I am excited to do that because it is one of the things that I think is the depth of the Enneagram is that we have these amazing strengths and we can use them as, I think you referenced as our superpower, mm-hmm. uh, and we can bring that superpower. Now, a good leader, though, knows their weaknesses as well. So we're going to talk about both sides as we look through, you know, what's the kryptonite <laughs> and what's the superpower that we can bring as we're leading our teams. I'm so excited for this. In my career um, within my corporate world, I used to be just so brokenhearted for people because they would, for whatever reason, they decided that they weren't good enough to be able to do successful. And so what they would do is they would put all their energy into trying to be someone different to fit into the mold of the company and to fit better into the branding of whatever they decided that the leadership criteria was in order to succeed. And literally my heart broke watching these people struggle to be someone that they just, it wasn't natural for them. So now within the entrepreneurial world, I also see sometimes people doing that same thing where they'll get caught up in what they see is happening online. And they think to themselves, I need to be more like her. I need to have a business more like her. I need to talk like her, walk like her, sound like her, look like her. And that's heartbreaking to me again. So let's take some time and go through all of the types. Let's shine the light on the strengths of each of those types. And then I'm really intrigued to hear about each type's blind spot because I know for myself, I'm a continual learner. I can't wait to hear more about this. I can't wait to dive in. So how I like to start a conversation about the Enneagram is to get people to visualize this this tool, this circle with these nine numbers around it. And it's kind of divided into three sections, three centers of intelligence. And this is one of the beauties of the strengths that we can bring as leaders through the tool of the Enneagram. We get to access our body intelligence. We get to access our emotional intelligence and then our intellectual intelligence. So our IQ, our EQ, and our GQ. (laughs) So we're going to start with the types that sit in what I call the GQ, the gut intelligence. So let's dive in with type eight if you want to and find out how they lead. Sure, let's do it. Okay, so here we go. So type eights are oftentimes called the challenger 
or, you know, they bring power and they're the, they're the type that kind of come into the room and go, who has the power in the room? I want to know. So if I know if I trust them or if I need to take over, right? So their strengths are they're direct and they're strategic. They're big action oriented leaders and they understand the networking. They're going to come with boldness. But sometimes that comes off as, so the kryptonite can be, that comes off as demanding or controlling, or oftentimes they're described as intimidating. My clients that are eights to work on is learning to access more of their emotional intelligence and their IQ, bringing their wisdom before uh, their demanding things of people. So it really helps a type eight to access these two other centers of intelligence and not just come against people all the time when they're leading. They're going to send you that really short email that doesn't even have your name at the beginning or their <laughs> name at the end. Um, and we don't need to take that as personal. That's just mm-hmm. the way they communicate and the way they lead in that uh, big action oriented way, which is an amazing strength as a leader. <laughs> I am laughing about this because I know I'm very familiar with a number of eights that are in my life and how you just described them is so bang on. And when they send those emails out, those just like one word little emails, <laughs> It, I just, I feel it because I would do something so different than that. So this is so much fun. So much fun. Okay. So then as a type eight leader, I loved how you said that we sh- that they should really be considering accessing their EQ and their IQ mm-hmm. before they start requesting things of their team. So one of the things that makes an eight really move into their superpower is when they take their team into consideration. It's difficult for an eight to say, how are you today? (laughs) Right? Because that takes them into this emotional space. And that feels very vulnerable to them. And we won't have time today to go into all of the reasons why that might be. But that's a vulnerable place for an eight. And so but it makes them such a great leader when they can really connect into their heart space and really begin to care about their team and just ask a couple of questions, even to begin the day or the week in their team meeting. Okay, that's wonderful. All right, let's go on to the next type. Awesome. So type nine, which is also in this gut space or this body center, is called the peacemaker. And immediately, doesn't that word just make you feel calm to say, ah, I want to hang out with a peacemaker. So nines bring peace and harmony and that mutual regard. Uh, They're very diplomatic and easygoing. And so as a team, or excuse me, as a leader, they really listen to all parts of their team and they'll take it all in. Unfortunately, that means sometimes they're very conflict avoidant. Mm-hmm. and can procrastinate and be indecisive. So that can kind of be their kryptonite as a leader. But that ability to include everyone and be patient and respectful really can gain um, a team's respect. But what really helps a nine, again, is when we move into these other two centers. Mm-hmm. So they sit in the gut center. So when a nine can move more down to what we call the type three, which is their emotional center, that's where they can really take action and begin to move out of this, oh, I'm not sure, you know, everybody not agree with this. So they can come into a meeting with an agenda. It'll make all the difference for a tight nine. They won't move into that. Well, I got the meeting started. Now I'm just listening to everyone else. An agenda is huge for a tight nine leader. Oh my gosh, I love that idea. So it's the agenda that actually is becoming their talk sheet that's giving them the confidence to stop resisting and keep moving forward. Right, because then they have a plan of action. And so for many times for the type nine, they're a great leader, but they don't always use their voice in a meeting. And so all the great ideas are in their head. So we want to move to that action space of the three and really get them, so that agenda, and even sharing that agenda out with their team before the meeting begins, you know, by email or written or whatever that might be, uh, depending on if it's virtual or in person. 
Geez, I would imagine, too, that sometimes type nines feel like they're getting the short end of the stick because if they're in a meeting or even if they're hosting the meeting and they tend to give over all of the time, all of the hot seat time to everyone else on the team, they're not getting their own needs met. They're not being able to share their own um, points of view. And therefore, they can actually leave a meeting feeling disappointed. Absolutely. And and then they leave going, oh, I wished I would have said that. I wished I would have spoke up. So by having, especially as the leader of a meeting, I've seen so many of my clients that I work with in coaching move. They're amazing type nines. I'm actually married to a nine. And Ooh. They're amazing partners in business because they're such team players. But if they're not given the place to use their voice or they don't learn how to use their voice and kind of wake up, so to speak, then they're really disappointed at the end of the meeting because they had all these amazing ideas. Okay. I love this. All right. Now on to the next type. Sure. So it just gets more fun all the time. Okay. So type one is often called the reformer and they see everything as how can we make it better? How can we make it more effective and how can we make it best? Unfortunately, that can lead to perfectionism. So they really strive for quality as a leader. They're going to be very organized. They're going to be very perceptive. Um, honesty and that truthfulness really means a lot to a type one. What can happen though, you know, anytime on the spectrum that we take it to the far end, then as a type one, they can be very impatient and overcritical and they can really come in. And this is where this, this gut space, um, they can be overreactive you know, we can't do it that way. No, that's not right. You know, you hear a lot of that type of language from a type one. It's about right and wrong. So when they can lead uh, through example and consistency and responsibility and that attention to detail, that is just such a beautiful place for a one to lead from. And then again, it's always about this movement into the other two centers of intelligence. So for a type one, many times, one of the beautiful things I've seen with my clients that are ones, because they can get caught up in this perfectionism, is learning to move towards their seven, which mm. is their head type, and really learning to have fun. So when you talk about the seven, if you're a one, and this sounds like you, really listen when we talk about the seven, because bringing some fun into your leadership, bringing some joy and some enthusiasm, and really doing some fun and off-the-wall things will bring out your creativity like none other. Wow, I'm really loving this because I think like everyone, including everyone that's probably listening to this, you can't help but your mind goes to someone who you believe fits this description. Mm -hmm. I, it's, that's kind of the fun of this. And of course, we see ourselves in a lot of this as well. And um, I think at the end of this, you and I should share <laughs> our type. I'm sure people, because I'm sure people are thinking that they know our types anyway. So let's just own it at the end of this for sure. But when I'm thinking about type ones, your, your comments about their sense of justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely know some people who have a high moral, like they take the high moral road. And so their sense of social justice is very very high. Sometimes people might describe it as even as extreme because they're, they're very willing to be bold and speak out about their um, disenchantment with justice that may be happening around them. And sometimes too, they, um, they take it really to heart, right? So if they're a leader and someone on their team is not meeting expectations, it's really gut wrenching for them it's very um, harmful. Like they feel like they have somehow been harmed or almost to the point where you mentioned like being over, they overreact to the underperformer on their team. They can. And because really as a reformer, they want everything to be good. Mm -hmm. And so when they see something that's not good, <laughs> I mean, goodness is a word or, uh, oh, that's so good. You'll hear a type one use that word <laughs> often mm -hmm. in their language. You know, that's so good when they see something. So if they see something that's not performing well, 
whether it's a person or a system or a process, it's almost heartbreaking for them. Yeah. All three of these types, this eight, nine, and one that sit mm-hmm. in this body center, feel these things in their body. Okay. And just respond almost from that. A one, it's gut wrenching for them. Mm-hmm. You know, now a type nine moves away from that body reaction. Remember, they don't want to do the conflict. So that's that away space. Mm -hmm. And that type eight just comes at you with everything. So it's just so interesting in these three centers of intelligence, how these three types as leaders all lead from this very body space, but they all do it differently, but they all feel it in their body. So to let go of that huge body feeling moving to their EQ, their emotions and their IQ can really help kind of what I call be in flow in all three centers of intelligence. So when I lead workshops, we really dive deep into this. I have some online things and some on-site things that I do uh, with my clients in workshops and with workshops with their teams. And we really dive deep into this idea of using all three centers so we can bring our superpower to the forefront as leaders and and as people that are on teams and leading teams as well. Right. And I think everyone needs to have a type one on their team, right? So having, having someone whose center is fixated on continual improvement, you know, having the eye on the attention to detail can really be helpful having someone like that on your team for sure. And then on the flip side, I love how you said that in order for them to be even more effective, that they need to at times lean into their fun side. I think we've all encountered people on our team that are what can sometimes be perceived as being so uptight about the minute details of everything. And then when you finally see them let their hair down and have some fun, it just makes the whole experience more joyful. Yeah. uh, Type one is that quality control person. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you brought out that as you think about these different types and you hear, you know, your leadership style, your type and how you lead, you also think about who do you need on your team? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, what type do you need on your team? And yeah, we could spend the whole podcast just talking about hiring, you know, into your team through the tool of the Enneagram because it really can set you up for some amazing uh, team dynamic uh, when you're not hiring someone exactly like you. So a type one is a great person to have on your team for attention to detail. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, on to the next type. Awesome. So now we're going to move into what we call the emotional centers of intelligence. So types two, three, and four come from this heart space. So you're going to hear a lot of that as we talk through. So type two is oftentimes called the helper. And they just naturally want to do just that, just help people. So as a leader, they have these amazing strengths of feeling so supportive of their team, they're motivating, they're warm, they're empathetic. They really bring that heart space, that EQ space at its fullest. So I think you can already imagine how this could lead (laughs) to some really kryptonite ways for a type (laughs) two leader Mm -hmm. because they can then get caught up in their team's emotions They can be overly supportive, overly empathetic, and now they're caught up in the, you know, emotional dynamics and the personal side of everything, either for their team or for the clients that they serve. And so to be a great two leader, it's keeping up in that supportive mode and sometimes accessing again their IQ to think through things and bring some of that thinking space and not just always be so much from that heart space. So when they move from helping towards really being loving, not Mm. codependent, Mm. (laughs) but loving, that's when they move in their superpower. You'll often hear me say two phrases. One is that we are responsible to our team members, but we're not responsible for them right? So we're not responsible for their spending habits. We're not responsible for whether or not they show up to work on time. We're not responsible for when they hit their targets or they don't hit their targets. And then the other one that I share all the time is that we can care for our team, but we can't take care of our team. Because once we start getting involved in the daily caring, where we're, um, you know, just getting involved in their family drama, um, helping them make 
bank payments that they may be behind on or, um, you know, really getting involved in their personal business, that's where the downfall really happens between the relationship between the leader and the team member. And I've seen many a type two feel so compelled to fix and improve the lives of their team members that they get involved at a really inappropriate level. I see this so much too, Shelly, in the work that I do. So as I'm coaching clients um, one-on-one or when I give an assessment um, and it comes back and they're a type two, I know that much of the work uh, that we're going to need to do is around boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so boundaries is a huge word for a type two because they can get so far in into the lives of others, um, you know, their team, family members, <laughs> the neighbors, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they just dive in and it comes from a loving space. But what happens is a type two loses their identity mm-hmm. in that and they take on the identity of others. So boundary work, I find so many times uh, when I'm working with someone that's a type two, when they can move to that, it just gives them so much freedom to be the leader that, that they've been given the beautiful gifts to bring. Yeah. I want, Oh my, Oh, this is really ringing true for me, for sure. Um, I've seen so many leaders like truly get way too involved and it really inhibits their team even seeing them as a leader. They see them more as a friend. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes, you know, I was just working with a client this week and she's a very strong uh, type two. Uh, she's actually a type three, but mm-hmm. uh, many times you'll hear in Enneagram language, people say I'm this type with this wing. Right. So that's kind of, you know, the arm to the ones, either the left or the right of you on the circle. And so she has a really strong type two. And when she was first building her business and building her team, she very much built it with friends, right? They're Mm -hmm. all contractors on her team, but they're her friends and she's taken care of them and done all the things that you just talked about. Well, now her business has grown to an amazing level. She's a very creative person, works in the art industry, and now she's needing to put out some good boundaries with these contractors and this team. And it's really hard to go back and do that when you know, they've been so enmeshed. So her two wing is really giving her some trouble right now as we're working through her developing these good boundaries. Yeah, it's such a such a critical point in terms of leadership, for sure. That's wonderful. Okay, on to the next type. Okay, well, I'm going to come clean and I'm going to go ahead and share my type because I'm a type three. Mm-hmm. And so it falls in the middle of this uh you know, center of intelligence of the heart types, and it's an achiever or a performer. So as type threes, we are very organized. We like to achieve goals. We're success oriented. Um, But those are our strengths. We're energetic. We're very entrepreneurial. We're confident. We go for the results. We can multitask like none other usually. But what happens is... (laughs) we can get ourselves overly focused at the expense of even taking care of our team. So when you talk about the two being the over helper, the three can kind of act much like an eight and just kind of work right through things Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of have such a can do attitude. And I claim it all the time that I used to be a workaholic. I mean, I got so much joy and so much charge and energy from how much I could get done. And so many threes as leaders struggle with that. So again, much of the work that a three has to do is to move over to their six, which is in that IQ space, which is the loyalty person and really learn to care about their team and to slow down a little bit and take a breath use their nine that they can access to, you know, spend some time just slowing down and breathing uh, because we go at 90 mile an hour. Most of the time we have lots of great ideas and we want all of them to come to fruition. (laughs) I'm just laughing with this because I am a three (laughs) and people always describe me as that all in girl. 
right? Because and I'm very decisive. So once I decide to do something, I am all in. And it's not even just with in the world of business. It's if I'm doing something within the community or if I'm, you know, for years I was a dance teacher. I'm very all in. But you're right. To the detriment of my own health, Mm -hmm. to the detriment of probably I will own it, not spending as much time as I could with my family or my close friends. So I love that we're looking at what are our strengths within each type and then what are our watch outs so that we can take some action to be able to at least minimize some of those watch outs. So what you just described, Shelley, you and I are kind of like twins in this type three space because everything I've ever done. So I've owned some retail businesses. I've, you know, done some direct sales things. I've lived a lot of life and done a lot of different things because that's a type three. Mm -hmm. They, They do a lot of different things. They've never had just one occupation usually in their life or one thing because we're always seeing the next thing. But with that, we get caught up in that. So as a type three leader, one of the things is to have good sounding boards. I think each of these types need a coach, right? We need uh, people that can come around us or a mastermind, whatever that is that we get, that we can have people that come around us that ask us good questions. So any good leader has people asking them good questions. But when you're a forward moving number, like a three or a seven or an eight, it's very important that you find people you can trust to ask you those good questions of, are you sure you want to say yes to that? Because let's just list out all the things you're already doing. Do you have the time and energy to do that? Or here's the better question. If you're a leader, does your team have the time Mm -hmm. and energy to do that? What are you going to say no to if you say yes to that? Right. So it's that whole idea of, I have a million ideas things I am so in love with that I really want to create, I really want to execute on. And then it's taking time to thoughtfully stop and think, this is amazing, but I don't need to do it all right now. I can map things out in quarters. I can map things out even within a three-year plan. So then I'm excited about being able to go and make those things happen, but not overwhelming me or my team or my family or my friends with the fact that I just want to have my pedal to the metal at all times. You know, you mentioned a 90 day process and that's part of what I work with in my brand, the real life process is, and that was life changing for me to Mm -hmm. take it from year long goals down to 90 day goals because it really opened up to me and to many of the types, the freedom that you get working in 90 day processes compared to, you know, a 12 month process, because the freedom is we get to reevaluate and re, you know, redo things, reset up our projects every 90 days. And for a type three, that feels really good. Like, oh, new energy, new stuff. Type threes really have to watch not following through. So to have someone on their team, that's a great at the follow through, Mm -hmm. um, that is that loyal, faithful, person that can follow through. So my um, community leader and online business manager, she kind of wears a couple of titles there, is a type six. Mm -hmm. And Erica and I work so well together because she does the follow through and the details. So I can create that visionary spot. You know, we've used those words too, visionary and integrator. And Mm -hmm. she can work more in that integrator role to really make those things you know, follow through and get all the details to work through. So again, when we talk about stacking your team, Mm -hmm. you know, we want to look at these things. The Enneagram is such a great tool to build your team well. Oh my gosh. I love this. This is just giving me so many incredible ideas. Thank you so much, (laughs) Teresa. I love it. This is fun. Okay. Let's on to the next. Okay. Here we go. This is the type four, our last one in the heart space. They are the individualist, sometimes called the romantic or the unique. So fours desire connection. They love connection um, with their 
what we call inner world and with others. They love to be with people in what I call the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So they can authentically express their feelings and they want to be unique. So they come up with very inspiring and creative and introspective and expressive ideas. So they're a little bit different type of leader because they have all of this creativity in them. But when they can surround themselves with a great team, oh my gosh, they are such amazing, artistic, creative leaders. And many times type fours get kind of categorized as they're always these musicians or artists. That is absolutely not true. There are so many ways to be creative. You know, uh, you can be creative at developing software or developing products. So uh, don't discount the type four as being a great leader. What happens, though, to a type four where they can get stuck is in this intensity that they have Mm -hmm. because they bring this beautiful uh, light and dark (laughs) uh, to the world. And so they can take on guilt. Uh, They can sometimes come across as moody Mm -hmm. because they can go so deep within. So they do create beautiful art. They create very deep products that you're like, how did anyone ever think of that? or that that was needed in the world, but they just have to watch that intensity that they have. So when they can move again towards that seven to have a little more joy in their life and towards that one to a little bit more of the systems and processes that their one brings and they can flow in their seven, four, one, what we call harmony triad. uh, Wow. They can just bring some amazing things to the world and to their teams. Wow, this is really taking me back to my corporate days, and <laughs> lunch and breaks, because my best friends that I hung out with in all my discretionary time in my corporate world were the friends that I always had them labeled as innovative. Mm-hmm. Like these were the guys that were so intent on building the next best system talking shop all day long, highly technically involved. And literally they were my best friends. And I loved hanging around with them because of their, their energy and their passion for their work. And they were just whip smart. And you could come to them with the problem and over lunch would start, you know, mapping out a a full blown flow diagram of how we could, how we could build something to solve the problem. So The whole idea of them truly wanting to build a reputation of being unique and having a specific skill set or being known as leaving their stamp on the organization because of their latest invention. To me, this is truly a really high performing type four person Mm -hmm. is so inspiring to others around them. They can really create this magical sense of we can do anything because we're just so smart. We can come up with the answer. Type fours are amazing in their creativity. I see a lot of type fours in some of the work I do um, that are also in the not-for-profit space. So they're Mm -hmm. amazing leaders in that space because of this compassion that they have and uh, their creativity and their vision. It's always value-based. So it's coming from that deep heart space. So they make amazing leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, in their ability, you know, if you've worked much in not-for-profit space, um, you really have to be creative in the not-for-profit space to uh, to lead teams of volunteers. Oh my gosh! And, you know, to lead teams of um, people that are not, you know, they're there because of their passion for the organization. So. In the work that I've done, you know, with uh, leaders and helping them lead well, this this type four is just so creative and so good at kind of making um, something out of nothing. (laughs) You know, they can see and and create that. So each of these types have areas of strengths, development, and weakness. And I think that's the beauty of the Enneagram. Different than other personality assessments, it's always inviting us 
to, you know, take that deeper look at whether it's daily, whether it's every 90 days, whatever weekly reviews to go, wow, where did I bring my best self? And where was I kind of, um, no, I wasn't, I wasn't living in my best self today or this week. And why not? What was I bumping up against that kind of took me to this other place? So it's such a great tool for asking those deeper questions. Yeah. I love the whole point of just recognizing if you want to continue to improve yourself as a leader, you need to stop and take some time to reflect Mm-hmm. reflect on the day, reflect on the week, reflect on the 90 days. And that's really what's going to give you just shine the light on any of the gaps and help you come up with a plan to be able to move forward to, to continue to improve. So this is wonderful. Okay. The next type. Okay. So let's move into the last center of intelligence. And that is the intellectual center of intelligence. And unfortunately, this is the one that people, you know, we always talk about your IQ, right? You know, Mm -hmm. so this is the one that people are the most familiar with, but we need all three in our lives. We were given all three. So we want to access all three, but let's dive in to the intellectual. So we have our types five, six, and seven. So five is our beautiful investigator. They're that fact finder and they thirst for information and knowledge unfortunately, sometimes then that means they're detaching from kind of some of their emotional space, but their strengths are that they're analytical, objective, systematic. They are the experts that we want to go to. And so they lead out of that idea of information and knowledge. Um, What can happen though, is that they can detach from the emotional part of things. So as a five leader, you want to lead through that research planning, logical insights and analysis, but you also want to have some people on your team that are bringing the emotional side of things and the gut reaction side of things so that you're not just looking at facts and figures all the time to make uh, decisions as to where your business is going or what the team needs to do next. So when they move from being that investigator to what I call wisdom, Mm Because wisdom means I'm not keeping it inside of me. I'm sharing it out with the world. So when someone's wise, we know they're wise because they've shared it with us. So a five is no longer just an investigator. They're bringing the beauty of their wisdom and that becomes their superpower. Here's all the things I know and here's how they take action in the world. (laughs) I'm not just putting it in my head and not ever putting it into action and creating data and just data and data and more data. But I'm like, and here's how it moves in the world. That's when you become wise and really move into your superpowers as a leader. Oh my gosh. I used to build critical paths for large multi-million dollar projects and working with some of the people on my team who would, they're that fact finder And they have such a high level of expertise that they just loved being in that space. I used to call it data mining. So when I would build the critical path, I would give them a period, a window of time where they were allowed and I held the space for them to continue to data mine. But once we got through that, (laughs) that timeframe on the, on the critical path, it was on to implementation because Mm -hmm. you're right. Like they're just, so intrigued with additional data that they could find that they could potentially use at some point in the project, but it can really be a stall factor sometimes as well. And then the other lovely thing about type fives is they will often present data to you that really can be a game changer. Yeah. They, they have an amazing ability to take in a lot of data And, you know, that can be so useful to your team, that information that they can bring. But if a type five is the leader, they also want to access their two, that loving space that they have and move towards emotion. My daughter is a five. Mm. And one of the beautiful things, um, you know, that the Enneagram can do in any space, whether it's your family dynamic, your team dynamic, is when I realized that she was a five, 
I realized early in high school that the reason she came home from school and was like checked out and vegged out is a five really can only handle so much connection to people. And then they need to pull back and pull in because they process their emotions after the fact. Okay. time to process those emotional responses. So we would laugh because she would come home from school and, you know, go to the couch and veg out. And then the next day she would say, you know what happened yesterday? Because mm-hmm. now she had processed it. Oh, wow. So as a leader, if you have a five on your team, make sure you follow up with them the next day on if they've been in a team meeting or they've sat in and given you lots of data and they've they've kind of sat back and taken it all in. They're a little bit detached at the time, but if you go check with them later, you would be amazed what you'll get out of a five about their perception of what went on in the room and how everything came together. Oh my gosh. I love that insight. The other thing we see with type fives is they, in the entrepreneurial space is that they can get caught in that where they're stalling themselves. Mm -hmm. They're reluctant to move forward So they continue to just do more research, buy more courses, buy more books, do more programs Mm -hmm. where they feel like they're taking action. They feel like they're moving forward, but in all actuality, they really are stalling. Yeah. And so I have found for the type fives that I've worked with, and I have an online course that sets you up in 90 days in productivity. Mm -hmm. And so the Enneagram is the beginning part of that because if we know ourselves well, if we learn about ourselves, we can move to do our best work, right? We can be that best leader. We can be that best entrepreneur and business owner. So I find for a type five, learning to work in these shorter periods of 90 days really helps them as well because they don't get stuck in so much fact finding Mm -hmm. about the projects they're working on because they have a shorter deadline. And so we're working in 90 day segments and that just releases them to go, Hey, I'm going to map this out for these, you know, 12, 13 weeks. And I need to be done with this at the end of that. So having a deadline for a type five, and if you're the leader and you're using your leadership skills as a type five, having deadlines with your team will really help you to move forward in incremental steps. Oh, I love this. And then you can celebrate all of those miles. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. So good. Okay. So what's the next type? Type six is the loyalist. And sixes are this beautiful, insightful space. Um, They are collaborators. They are problem solvers. They can really do that risk assessment. And their loyalty and their perseverance, they are the true team player. So what happens though for a type six then as a leader, they can have to really watch not being so much of a team player, kind of like the two that mm-hmm. that they're in with the team. They, they need to really work to keep themselves as the leader and move from being that loyal, faithful to really being devoted to the team, but leading with their superpower, moving towards their three of action and effectiveness uh, to keep the team moving. So again, much like the nine, coming with the agenda, knowing exactly what problem we're going to solve, not getting caught up too much in the details with the rest of the team, but keeping themselves, this is where a mastermind can be huge for a type six, Mm. so that they're up with kind of the level of leadership, not caught down, you know, if they have two or three people on their team, that they're not caught in the task mode all the time, but they're really being challenged to be in that leadership uh, place. Uh, A mastermind is awesome for a type six. Mm, I love this. Oftentimes type sixes truly believe that if they roll up their sleeves and get involved in the heavy lifting along with their team, then that helps generate this higher level of respect from their team members. And I certainly think there are times where all hands on deck is required for sure. But I like the way you presented this, that their watch out is to not spend all the time rolling up their sleeves and, you know, working alongside their team. They need to be out front doing business development, playing that CEO role 
CEO role and just really, you know, moving the business forward and trust that the team knows how to do the implementation. Exactly. And so for a type six, as they're building their team, they're going to want to probably be drawn to and hire another type six. And that may not be the best hire for them. Right. Because that's somebody just like them. And so they really need to, they don't need a person that moves towards other people like they do. They partner well with a three. I mentioned earlier, um, the person I have on my team, Erica is a six and I'm a three. So we play off of each other well. So, you know, for a six, um, they need a two is not a great hire for them either because a six and a two both move toward people and really get involved in the details of people's lives. Boundaries are huge for type sixes and type twos. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, this is, um, I'm just so loving this. So loving this. There's so much. There's so much. Okay. So so the last last one. Yeah. And I, I love that usually when we do this, I end with the type seven because everybody needs a seven in their life. Some of my best friends are sevens because they are the enthusiasts. So sevens just have great innovative ideas. They're high energy, their um, enthusiasm and curiosity and engagements. They are the life of the party. Um, and so type sevens with that enthusiasm, uh, they're quick thinking. They just, you know, like, let's go do this, you know, let's go do this. And, uh, I always say, if you have a seven on your team, they really don't love showing up at meetings because meetings are boring for them because (laughs) they have so many ideas, but they lead through those strengths. So if you're a type seven, it's kind of difficult. Again, much like a three, you have all these ideas and all these things going on, which really can bring a lot of energy to your team. But your superpower is uh, leaning even towards your one, which brings those systems and those processes because uh, sevens really do want to avoid pain. I mean, they really don't like to look at kind of the, the bad side of things or the dark side. It's always, it's fine. We can move on. It's fine. We got this. Mm-hmm. So really leaning into their one and going, what processes and systems do I need to have in place so that I have the freedom uh, to be quick thinking and imaginative and be this visionary, but yet I know that I have great systems. So a one and a seven are a great pair together. Um, and a three and a seven work well together. I think that's why so many of the people that I love to hang out with are type sevens because they make me have fun and encourage me to have fun. So the development, kind of the kryptonite for that seven is that unfocusedness mm-hmm. and that rebellious side that they can have because The rebellion comes from, I really don't want to see the downside and I don't really want to feel the pain. Um, So sometimes their invitation is to move to their four, that, that emotional space of their four and sit with kind of what isn't good and what, what's hard. Uh, So that development for them, they're always going to see with rose colored glasses and evaluation is hard for a seven. So to have a type one that helps you do that or a type three is really going to bring out your best leadership. Wow. And now I'm thinking too that sevens who have a tendency to want to pivot often Mm -hmm. would be more successful if they had a one working alongside them to make sure that the foundations of their business are strong and therefore can withstand any pivot that the marketplace is generating or they themselves as CEO is trying to generate. Right. The seven, the three, and the eight all have trouble with wanting to pivot too often because they have lots of ideas. That's just who they are. And so, you know, they're creating these ideas all the time. And for a seven, many times they'll want to go to something else because this hasn't worked well. Mm -hmm. But instead of kind of what do I need to do to kind of reinvent that or to adjust a little bit, let's just go start something new. (laughs) Right. Right. Oh, this is so good. 
<laughs> I'm loving all of this. this well, you're so speaking wonderful. my language, so <laughs> it's this good stuff. So wonderful. I could talk this stuff all day. I really, really, really find this insightful as a leader, someone who's focused on building teams and, you know, wanting to help coach our clients to be able to create their wonderful hiring strategy that includes their next best hire. This is all just gold. So many gold nuggets here. So before I let you go today, Teresa, I want to give you a chance to ask me anything. Is there anything that looks like help to you today? You know, there actually is, Shelly, as we were talking, I think as a type three, that ability to see all the different things that can go on in all these different ideas. What are some suggestions that you have? Because I know you're also a type three for kind of reining those in and not letting go of the idea, but being able to hold on to it maybe for future consideration. Well, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have Evernote and if I didn't have notes on my phone. I am constantly coming up with ideas And I find what works well for me is if I acknowledge the idea, let it simmer with me for a few minutes, get excited about it so that I feel those emotions that are bubbling up about the idea, and then take the idea and put it down on paper. The fact of just putting it down on paper, whether it's a flip chart in my office, whether it's on Evernote, um, I have a page in Evernote for podcasting ideas, I also have a page in notes on my phone for podcasting ideas, guests that I want to bring on, new projects that we want to start at BizChicks. By capturing them all, it gives my head permission to release the idea, even if it's only momentarily. And then that frees me to go on about my day. And then I take time at the end of every month to go through all those notes and compile them into some sort of order. So what were the ideas that, are just trashable, right? Like I get so many ideas sometimes that at the moment they, I think it's genius. But then when I look back on, I'm like, Oh my gosh, that was ridiculous. (laughs) So then I call those trashables. So I just trash those out. But then there's some really juicy ideas there where I stop and think to myself, okay, this is a wonderful idea. I'm still in love with it. When would it make the most sense to start talking about it with the team so that we can consider implementing it? Is it this quarter? Is it the next quarter? Am I going to save this for our next all in-person team meeting that we're going to have so that I can have um, Tiffany and Natalie around me so that we can start to hash these out? So what I do is I start to map them out. So I'm acknowledging the fact that I come up with all these ideas, but I also acknowledge the fact that I don't need to do them all personally. I'm also known for giving away ideas, especially in my local community. I am often... I will have this idea and I think that is genius for her. This would work perfectly for him. And I actually contact these people and I'll say to them, I had, I had an idea today. I thought you might want to consider it. And I just release it and just give it over to them. So what that does is it creates more momentum in my mind to be able to bring more ideas in. And then I also know that I don't have to own them all that I can put them into some order. I can plan them out. And then it's okay that if idea actually comes to life three years from now versus three days from now. I love that because you just described really uh, living in what we call the harmony triad of the Enneagram. You know, the, the three, six, and nine are connected. And you just described using all three of those spaces. And so that really gives me some insight of what would make the most sense to talk about and when do I bring it up and how do I trash it if it's bad. So thank you for that. Yeah. And it's really about like this. So the trashable ideas, it's, it's okay to not have, you know, the million dollar ideas. I like to call some of my ideas, unmillion dollar ideas. <laughs> and, awesome. it's, it's, and it's okay if some of them are absolutely trashable. It doesn't mean that I'm any less of a person because I had six trashable ideas this month versus last month I had four. I'm not, you know, I'm not trending towards more trashable ideas. I think how I think about it is I'm just having so much abundance of ideas lately because I'm typically in a higher vibration. I'm really loving what I'm doing. It just generates more and more enthusiasm Mm. for more and more ideas. That is awesome. I love it. Thank you.
The word Thank trashable you. is new in my vocabulary now. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Well, I'm so happy that I could help you today. And I know for sure that your overview of all of these nine types, how we can embrace who we are within our own type and become the best leader that we can be without trying to become someone different, but also realizing who we are, noticing our blind spots and our watch outs and be able to put some actions into play bring some other people around us so that we have a nice harmony, like a really sense of blending of the personalities to really create a strong team. I think it's just wonderful. Thank you. It has been so fun to have this conversation and I can't wait to see all the biz chicks just grow in, in what you just talked about our blind spots and our watch outs. Oh my gosh. So excited. So before I let you go, one last thing, can you tell us what are you most excited about that's happening in your in your life? I am very excited about a couple things that are coming up in the new year. I've got some online courses that I'll be doing around the Enneagram that'll be coming Mm. up in the new year, but I also have a new podcast that'll be coming out right after the first of the year. So we're recording this. Uh, It'll come out in 2019 of January and it's called the Enneagram in your real life. And so I am very excited about that podcast because if we can take the Enneagram and use it in our everyday, ordinary life, it just invites us constantly to growing to be our best real self. Oh my gosh. I am so excited for you. I love the fact that there's going to be a podcast dedicated to this because I know you are so passionate about this tool and I've seen the success that you've had in working with your clients to use the tool as the tool was intended, right? So it's an additional added value to our lives, right? We're not going about our day plunking people into types. What we're doing is we're just recognizing that it takes all of us. And the other thing I've learned too with with the Enneagram, with the Colby, with Myers-Briggs and DISC, we all have the capability to use all of these personality types. We We actually all have these personality types within us. It's what, what stage of our lives are we leaning more towards one than the other? Absolutely. They're all useful and for different times in our lives and different seasons, and they all overlap in some way. Mm -hmm. It is what we do with the tool. And that's why I want to talk about on this podcast, you know, how's it playing out in your real life, you know, with the relationships that you have, with the teams that you're building, And I specifically work with entrepreneurs, creators, and leaders. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the content that you're creating, you know, how does it come out? How do you create content that shows your best real self? And so the Enneagram can be so useful for all of that. So I am very excited about this new podcast. Well, I'm excited. I've already subscribed. (laughs) Thank you. So I am super excited to be able to see this drop into my Apple podcast queue each week and just really taking advantage of your wisdom, Teresa. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you. It has been a blast to be here today. Thanks, Teresa. So here's the thing. If you're hiring or thinking about hiring, or reflecting on your team's success, I encourage you to consider the Enneagram and have a look at your type. What is it about your type that's helping you be effective leading your team? What are your blind spots? And what are you going to put into place to ease those blind spots? I want to wrap up today by sharing with you a few famous women leaders and their type. Let's start with the body center. Those are types eight, nine, and one. Type one, the reformer. In this group, we have actress and activist Jodie Foster, Dr. Christiane Northrup, and Hillary Clinton. Type eight. The Challenger, we have designer Donna Karen, actress Queen Latifah, and author Terry McMillan. And type nine, the Peacemaker, 
We have actresses Jennifer Aniston and Sandra Bullock. Activist extraordinaire Gloria Steinem and Queen Elizabeth II. In our heart center, those are types two, three, and four. We have the helper, type two. That's Dolly Parton, Diana, Princess of Wales, and Barbara Walters. Type three, the achiever. We have author and screenwriter Nora Ephron, Oprah, and country legend Reba McIntyre. And type four, the individualist, we have two time rock and roll Hall of Famer Stevie Nicks, Meryl Streep, and novelist Anne Rice. And the last center is the head center. Those are types five, six, and seven. Type five, the investigator. We have Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, photographer Annie Leibovitz, and aviator Amelia Earhart. Type six, we have the loyalist. That's Ellen DeGeneres, Julia Roberts, and novelist Annie Lamont. And type seven, the enthusiast, that's Cher, Tina Turner, and journalist Katie Couric. So there you have it. You are in great company. All of these incredible women that I shared with you did not do it alone. They all had a team. So remember, if you have a dream, you need a team. I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Stacking Your Team. Please click subscribe in your podcast app so you never miss an episode. And head on over to bizchicks.com slash join to get access to the private Facebook group we host for women entrepreneurs. The group is free to join. And when you do, you get access to the complimentary downloads associated with both of our podcasts. We include the links in our weekly newsletter. No matter where you have come from or where you are going, you are the leader your company needs and you are worthy of being CEO. Stay focused, biz chicks, and go stack your team. Oh, 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 oh,